about. I want to talk to you today about the coming technological singularity. I want to talk to you about transhumanism. I want to talk to you about the coming human enhancement revolution because, folks, there is a growing serious body of individuals in the world today who actually imagine the use of those monkey genetics as well as synthetic forms of life uh, and other forms of what not, if you will, as being applied to our human biology in the very near future towards a post-human condition. They are called transhumanists. And for those of you who may not know what I mean when I use that term, transhumanist or transhumanism, that is simply the title that is given to describe this growing, diverse cultural movement that imagines that we now have it within our grasp to, pay, uh, to take man into the next step in our evolution. We are going to brain-machine interface ourselves with artificial intelligence systems. At the germline level, we are going to genetically alter the human species so that all life forms born downline from Homo sapien will be a new form of man. We are going to use technocratic tools, genetics, robotics, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, synthetic biology, neuropharmacology, just a whole lot of stuff that ends with the phrase ology. We are going to use that to permanently undo God's creation. And the first thing that you need to realize is that this vision, ladies and gentlemen, is no longer considered to be fringe in military laboratories around the world, from the executive level of governments on down, in monster corporations that are betting trillions of dollars uh, uh, into the future, there is a dream that is taking place. And here's another thing I bet you don't know. Your tax dollars are being used right now to define the language around which this new... Uh, creation, if you will, this new form of Nephilim, Nietzsche's dream of the Ubermenschen, Hitler's dream of the Aryan super race, we are literally moving towards uh, not just the precipice, we have stepped over the precipice and are now uh, moving into a, uh, what is called the hybrid age, which we will be talking about in a moment uh, with regard to these slides. Now one thing that I should say very quickly is it is my habit to walk back and forth to point at that to use this little thing to point at that, and everybody is telling me that is a giant waste of time. Don't do it. And now I think they lied to me, but I do see two blondes sitting up here, so maybe not. They told me there were two blondes with tasers, and that if I stepped away from this pulpit, their job was to shock me back into position. I'm not kidding. And the thing was, and what's scaring me is not just one of them told me that. One told me, and then the next one said the same thing in a different room. And then Chuck Missler told me that. I believe him. What's he got to lose? Huh? He's already famous. What's shocking one preacher like me going to do to his reputation? That may be billed on it. Well, in any case. Okay, here we go. Uh, uh, I, I was completely aware last year when I went to the Science and Supernatural Conference in Dayton, Ohio. When I spoke there, I was convinced that the average Ohioan was completely unaware of how, right there in their state in recent years, the Case Western Reserve Law School had been the recipient of $773,000 from the NIH, the National Institute of Health. The National Institute of Health is the largest government department in the United States that hands out your tax dollars for health-related science and research. But why did they give $773,000 to Case Western Reserve Law School? It was so that a professor by the name of Maxwell Melman, the lead bioethicist at Case Western Reserve Law School, would begin a 24-month research period in which he would lead a team of law professors, bioethicists, scientists, other uh, interested and qualified parties over a 24-month period. Ladies and gentlemen, for the express purpose of establishing two things, if you want to look up on the screen, uh, number one in that middle paragraph there, you'll see that it was to develop standards for tests on human subjects in research that involves the use of genetic technologies to enhance normal individuals to make them smarter, to make them stronger. And notice this little eugenic caveat, to make them better looking. <laughs> 
So as we move towards our super selves and we develop Terminator-like eyesight, I guess, and we can really peer down on those blondes they've got guarding this front row up here or other people, we're sure not going to want any homely people clouding up the landscape, are we? So as we go gazelling over top buildings, uh, tall buildings in a single bound, we're going to be so pretty as we do so. <laughs> Imagine how our tax dollars are being used in ways that we don't know about. Uh, but in any case, the 24-month uh, research period came and went. Because this is research that I do, I have been waiting. By the way, this concluded a little over one year ago, and I have been waiting with bated breath to find out in what way standards were developed for the genetic alteration of the human species. By the way, if you read the full press release, it was also to begin developing the guidelines that will be used for establishing public policy, that is, the law. And how will the law need to be amended in order to extend constitutional and Bill of Rights privileges to human non-humans? This is humans who have been sufficiently genetically altered as to no longer even be considered to be human under our current set of laws. The uh, Brookings Institute, the number one policy think tank in the world right now, is writing a series creating the legalese uh, around this whole debate called the Future of the Constitution series. I recommend you go there and read the series, especially articles number 9 and articles number 10, where they are talking about within a decade the genetic engineering of homosexual communities. Number one policy think tank in the world, number one policy think tank to the United States, bends the air of lawmakers talking about genetically engineered gay communities and gen genetically engineered gay people who will need, because we are their creators, we will need to extend to them what our Constitution says we have in terms of inalienable rights that were extended to us from our Creator. So we are entering into a very unusual period of time. Now, before we go any further, if you're sitting here today, amazed that I haven't rushed off to one side yet, and besides that, live in Idaho, and maybe you are uh, feeling a little bit envious right now of your Ohioan brethren and cistern, yes, I did say cistern, <laughs> and feeling like they might be getting the leg up on you in the genetic sciences, uh, fear not. If you look at the screen, you'll notice that Idaho, as well as every state in the Union, the genetics revolution is on. When I knew that I was going to be speaking here today, the first thing I did was I went to Google. It's very simple. You, whatever state you're from, do this. Just go type in words like genetic engineering, GMOs, whatever, and the name of your state, and then sit back in awe of how your tax dollars in your state are also being used. Uh, some of the stories that popped up here in Idaho, this is the National Association of Science Writers talking about genetically modified animals having the potential for food and medicine, and they're uh, interviewing here one of your scientists here in the state of Idaho. The USA Today article talking about Idaho company trying to perfect a genetically modified potato that's tastier and healthier, so your famous Idaho spud is literally about to get a new life with emphasis on life. Of course, here's the Bioscience Org website celebrating the birth of the first cloned mule born in America, which was born here in the state of Idaho. Other articles, by the way, that popped up on the screen had to do with stem cell sciences in Idaho, had to do with the creation of human-animal chimeras at the embryonic level, which is part of the pharmaceutical research. And by the way, last night, I wasn't even looking for this. I was checking my email, and I thought, well, I'll just check my Google News alerts. And here was another article from an Idaho farmer, and the name of the article was uh, GMOs Making Their Way Into Your Pantry. And the, what this farmer was talking about is he is a farmer that raises large alfalfa fields here in Idaho, and he's very concerned because his alfalfa is being contaminated by genetically modified uh, alfalfa that's also being raised here in Idaho, but that the dairy cows that are feeding on this alfalfa are assimilating the genetically modified organisms in their milk, which is then going to your local superstore, and you are drinking GMOs, something that we absolutely do not 
not know very much about in terms of its long-term impact on the health. But ladies and gentlemen, the point is this. All across the United States, it isn't just Idaho, it isn't just Ohio, the state that I come from, Missouri, at the University of Missouri, we are raising humanized pigs, pigs that have human DNA in them uh, for experiments in xenotransplantation. This is happening in every state in the Union, and we are the laboratory rats. Well, you might be saying, oh, surely, Tom, these have just got to be isolated news stories, right? I mean, you just went out and picked a couple of stories to try to impress Chuck Missler, or as, as if I could do that, <laughs> or to prop up your thesis to try to make it look like it's more important than what it really is. Here's the truth, ladies and gentlemen. Before my house burned down, didn't your house burn down one time, Chuck? Oh, well, thank God. Somebody lied to me. Before my house burned to the ground in January of this year and my wife and I walked away with not more than one wheelbarrow load of singed stuff, I lost not only a library I had been collecting for 30 years, but over 6,000 pages of documents uh, on this whole uh, area. I could literally stand before you today for 10 hours and page through report after report, peer-reviewed medical journals, peer-reviewed science journals, line items in military budgets here in the United States. Did you know that the 2011 presidentially approved DARPA budget, our, our little friends out there, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, that this year's presidentially approved budget has millions of dollars in it for figuring out how to edit the DNA of our soldiers? Uh, did you know that in this year's DARPA budget there are millions of dollars for the creation of what is called bio-design, which is a new synthetic form of life, something that has never existed before. Furthermore, they want it to be militarized, which we don't know what that means, and more importantly, they want it to be immortal, something that cannot be killed. Literally, what they're trying to do is figure out how to circumvent the curse. They're trying to get around cellular death, genetic death. With the curse that God placed on Adam and Eve at the fall, our science departments and our military trying to figure out how to get around that and to enter some kind of immortal transcendence without Jesus Christ. It's in this year's DARPA budget. As a matter of fact, I photocopied the pages and put them in the book Forbidden Gates just so people would know I'm not making this up. Well, but anyway, so that you know that I'm not making this up, let's take a look at just a few of these various reports. Here's the 2010 State of the Future report. This is from the Millennium Project. And by the way, uh, the last time I checked, they had not yet published the 2011 report. That's why it says this is the newest uh, report. Um, the Millennium Project was founded in 1996 after a three-year feasibility study with the United Nations University, the Smithsonian Institution, Futures Group International, and the American Council for the United Nations University. It's a global futures research think tank of futurists, scholars, business planners, policymakers who work for international organizations, governments including the government of the United States, corporations, non-governmental organizations, and universities. Here is a quick excerpt. You can get the CD, read the whole report. Here's the excerpt. As computer code is written to create software to augment human capabilities, so too genetic code will be written to create life forms to augment civilization. When I first read that, I said, what in the world are they talking about here? So I read the report and followed up on it, and here's what I found out. Some of you may be aware how that uh, many agencies around the world, including our government, and our military especially, has had a very strong interest for the past few decades and have spent billions of dollars in the quest to decode the secret brain uh, language of the brain, the neural code, the neuron pulses of the brain. We have an interest in this, perhaps even for weapons technology purposes, to be able to con uh, control literally the thoughts of individuals uh, at a distance. But beyond that, there are practical applications. Imagine the benefits to a, uh, to a paraplegic who could uh, drive a wheelchair by thought alone. So there's a lot of benefits that could come out of this kind of technology. It's called brain-machine interfacing. But uh, the military has been uh, figuring out how to decipher the syntax the uh, complex communication rules around the electrical firings within your brain. They follow a consistent pattern that is repeatable. And it has been a daunting task 
to try to figure out that secret language. But over the decades, well, you may have gone to YouTube at some point, and uh, you watch the, uh, one of the early uh, illustrations there of a racist monkey, and it's got a chip implanted in the hippocampus of its brain, and it's got wires running out of its brain that's going into a computer, and by thought alone, the monkey has learned how to move a computer cur a cursor around on a screen in order to make decisions and then to get rewards. Well, that was a very early illustration of this technology. The technology has gone crazy in just the last few years, especially the last 36 months. We have had amazing breakthroughs in developing the algorithms that can work with uh, breaking the neural processes of the brain down into digital code, that is, strings of ones and zeros, where it can then be broadcast into a receiving station somewhere and reinterpreted to its exact meaning, uh, orders, emotions, whatever that might be. Uh, the neuro you know what I'm talking about, don't you? You're sitting here right now, you're listening to me, and thoughts are going through your head. That's neural activity. You're sitting there thinking, man, this guy is out of his ever-loving gourd. Or you're sitting there thinking, geez, I'd love to go to the bathroom, but if I get up, everybody's going to look at me. Or whatever it is you're thinking, that's the neural pulses of the brain. Well, now, by the way, in just the last 36 months, we have developed extracranial neural readers. Uh, in, in fact, this technology is advancing so quickly that at Christmas last year, a couple of the games makers in, uh, introduced game systems where children can play games uh, via thought alone, mind control, moving characters around on a screen. Now this year, I understand there's going to be 10 or 20 new systems coming out. Furthermore, televisions next year, beta televisions that you will be able to control by thought alone. I read that and said, really? I mean, we're not already big, fat, dumb, couch potato-y enough that we're going to sit there and just think? I want my robot to bring me another beer, and I want to change the channel 23 and turn up the volume. Really, get up and walk before you die. <laughs> Beta versions of smartphones within the next 18 months where you will think, call mom. And what's happening, uh, at the University of Chicago had a report on this where they were talking about how this technology is being developed right now, being tested in Afghanistan by our soldiers who are wearing a device. I read the report, no bigger than a Bluetooth that sits above their ear and extracranially is reading the neuron pulses of the brain, broadcasting it to a receiver where it can be interpreted. And what the uh, University of Chicago was talking about is how this is very quickly leading now to what will become a synthetic form of telepathy where soldiers will be able to communicate with each other by thought alone and it's also leading to a synthetic form of telekinesis where soldiers will be able to control objects move about war uh, uh, robotic war fighting machines and they showed uh, a guy wearing a helmet a soldier with a panoramic screen on the front of it and they were illustrating how he is watching the distant battlefield that a drone is flying over and by thought alone he would be able to tell the drone to uh, drop its payload, take pictures of something, move on to a new place. In other words, we're building Terminator uh, technology. Well, so what the 2010 State of the Future report is saying is, as the computer code is written to create the software that will thus augment our human capabilities, what is going to happen? Ray Kurzweil talks about this uh, in his film Transcendent Man, which Chuck Missler is in, and in much of his other stuff. If you've read his book, The Age of Spiritual Machines, uh, and, and on the uh, technological singularity, by the way, technological singularity simply is the title they've given to explain the date when we reach what is called strong artificial intelligence basically a synthetic conscious mind. And we will invent this. Uh, authors like Hugo de Garris, if you've read his book, The Artelect War, believes it, and, and Hugo is an atheist, and he believes it's going to lead to what, if you read, he's only describing Armageddon. But in any case, strong artificial intelligence, a synthetic god. That's what uh, Hugo refers to it as. We are building a deity, is his words. And it will be trillions of trillions of times smarter and more powerful than every Einstein that has ever lived. And many experts believe we're going to arrive at that moment within the next couple of decades. Well, what they are talking about in this report is that all of these, uh, this phenomena, all of these advances in technology uh, seem to be rushing towards a point in time in which everything we have ever known about life on earth and interactivity, 
Everything in one day is going to change. Everything is going to go out the door. Everything you've ever thought you had known, your gray matter simply will not be able to keep up with it. And Kurzweil, as others, as well as the state of the future, what they're saying is, since this, uh, the potential of this technology will so outweigh our capacity to be able to handle it, it is going to become necessary then to start changing us. And that's what they mean. Genetic code will be written to create life forms, synthetic forms of life, nanobots, other things that will integrate with our cognitive ability and enhance our brains so that we then will be able to fully appreciate and enjoy all of the benefits of becoming Star Trek's Borg. Foreign Policy Magazine, the Washington, D.C.-based award-winning magazine of global politics, economics, and ideas, just this month agrees with our Borg-like future, and they have published a new fantastic uh, special report called The Future Is Now. I would recommend you go there and read the entire report, but here is one of the excerpts. Quote, as we try to understand an incipient future in which technology has insinuated itself into every sphere and nook of human activity, from the manipulation and replication of DNA to space exploration, and in which humans continuously seek ways to speed up their biological evolution to match the breakneck pace of technological evolution. Look, notice this. The only way to do that is going to be to incrementally integrate with technology, launching an era of change and innovation that we call the hybrid age, end quote. This is only one of numerous special reports that are coming out now, including military analysis that are referring to this term, the hybrid age. And ladies and gentlemen, they mean exactly what it sounds like they mean. They're saying there was the Bronze Age, there was the Agrarian Age, there was the post-industrial age, there was the industrial age, there was the information age that gave birth to the internet, but we not are going to, we have entered into what is now called the hybrid age in which every living thing, everything that God made is going to be hybridized. Think about that. The God who set barriers between the species and ordered that each kind only reproduce after its own kind has us in his face now saying, yeah, but we think we're going to do something different. We are entering into the hybrid age. We are genetically modifying crops. We are genetically modifying animals. We are creating transgenic forms of animals. We're talking about everywhere, all across the world, in the United States, Europe, Austria, China, all, all, all over the place, this is happening. We are genetically altering humans at the embryonic level. In Britain right now, there is designer baby technology, which has already started, sex selection, hair color, eye color. Uh, the next step, of course, will be germline genetic engineering to start engineering their genetics at the earliest level, the sperm level or the egg level or the earliest embryonic level so that it then becomes adapted into their genotype. We engineer a new form of human whose genotype is different than yours is, which means whatever we engineer, that has become heritable. Everything born down line for that re-engineered human will become as it is. Does this sound to anybody but me like this is something we tried on earth once before? Yeah, this is happening. We're entering into the hybrid age uh, where everything is going to be altered. I'll have to move quickly if I'm going to get through all this. Uh, the Mail Online, this is one of the top uh, news stories, I mean news sources out of the United Kingdom. Your children will live to see man merge with machines, but will it save or destroy us? Here is the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, redesigning humans, the final frontier. And as a matter of fact, Professor Margaret uh, uh, McLean here is actually talking about uh, people like Professor Gregory Stock, who is a leading transhumanist advocate of germline genetic engineering, the permanent uh, actually, look at what he says here uh, in that last paragraph, paragraph 4. We know that Homo sapien, that's you, is not the final word in primate evolution, but few have yet grasped that we are on the cusp of profound biological change, poised to transcend our current form and character on a journey to destinations of new imaginations, end quote. Of course, again, I would take issue. I don't think this is a new imagination or thought. I think this is an old imagination or thought. And by the time we get to the end of this presentation, you'll see that I also think that it's very prophetic. Hey, here's a scientific American. Triple helix. 
designing a new molecule. You didn't even know your double helix is outdated, did you? Here we sit, Ford Pintos, Chevy Chevettes, not even aware that our benevolent overlords are working overtime to upgrade all of us, at least to Cadillacs, if not Royals Royce altogether. Here's Christianity today. The techno-sapiens are coming. When God fashioned man and woman, he called his creation very good. Transhumanists say that by manipulating our bodies with microscopic tools, we can do better. Are we ready for the great debate? Well, the techno-sapiens are coming, but when are they going to be here? Only two weeks ago at MIT, the famous Massachusetts Institute of Technology's M-Tech conference, we were told, get ready now for a new human species. Here's an excerpt from the article, The Ability to uh, Engineer Life is going to spark a revolution. That's the hybrid age revolution, the new revolution uh, that will dwarf the industrial and digital revolutions, drop down to the bottom, because we can engineer our environment and ourselves. Humanity is moving beyond the constraints of Darwinian evolution, and the result may be an entirely new species. Here's New Scientist magazine agreeing with the new species of man. And in this article, Evolution Machine, Genetic Engineering on Fast Forward, they are talking about some of the instruments that are being used to move us towards our post-human future, including gene sequencing machines. And they're talking here about how the technology is becoming much more affordable. The machines are becoming much uh, more powerful. Notice under that, uh, that little italicized, uh, right under that line, that little italicized opening remark, Automated genetic tinkering is just the start. This machine could be used to rewrite the language of life and create new species of humans. And notice that interesting graphic they created where it's got the double helix coil, the human coil, going into the machine and at the top being spat out all kinds of alien green, wonderful forms of new humanity mixed up with all kinds of other stuff. Well, among the thousands of laboratories around the world, where creators have been honing these skills towards our post-human future, human-animal chimera research has been a very important model. I want to talk about this news story here for just a moment. First, notice that this is Reuters news. I want you to know that this is not weekly world news when you see what they're talking about here. I don't want you to think I grabbed this uh, from the tabloid section as I was exiting that super center. Reuters news, and look at this headline. Scientists want debate on animals with human genes. But look at this first paragraph. A mouse that can speak, a monkey with Down's syndrome, dogs with human hands or feet, British scientists want to know if such experiments are acceptable or if they go too far in the name of medical research. Now, please note that this article was published 24 months ago. Why would I include this article with these more recent uh, 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 statements that are being put forward? You'll understand that in a moment. And let me give you just a very quick background to this. This article was uh, an interview with scientists in Britain who had been doing research into human-animal chimera creation. Now, why would the pharmaceutical industry have an interest in creating a part human, part animal at the embryonic level? And you should know because this is mostly what's driving a lot of both stem cell and human-animal chimera research. It's, it's really quite simple. It's because it is a daunting task for pharmaceutical corporations, monster corporations, to get permissions to do human trials with new drug therapies. And, it, and they have the potential of making untold amounts of money. And how many know that when it comes to the giant corporations, it's really all about money? It's not about ethics. It's about money most of the time. Well, they, they stand to make trillions of dollars as we move into the future with new drug therapies. And one way to test a new drug therapy against human enzymes is to create a part human, part animal, or a part animal with human enzymes that then allows them uh, to bypass the human trial uh, requirements, uh, the daunting task of getting permission to do so, and now they can test their drug therapy to see if that part of the human genetics in that animal is responding in a particular way. Okay, so this is what these scientists were doing. Human-animal chimera research in Britain, and they went to the government of Britain, and they wanted to know if they could have access to public funds, tax dollars, to fund their research into this. Well, people in Britain started finding out about it, and especially among the pro-life community, 
there were those who did not like the idea that their money would be used to create a part human, part animal that then would be experimented on and then killed. That might be okay with some of us. No, I don't think so. <laughs> well, it wasn't okay with them either. And so what happened was there was kind of an uproar. And so the government of Britain decided to host what they called the embryology discussions, which was kind of an open forum in which they invited in all kinds of disciplines, scientists, bioethicists, uh, even members of the clergy. And get this, the Vatican sent two bishops to testify during the embryology discussions. And one of the Vatican's spokesmen said that if a woman participated in these experiments, by providing egg or ovum, and then later developed a crisis of conscience and wanted to raise this part human, part animal as her child, she ought to have the right to do so. That was the advice from the bishop from the Vatican. Well, in any case, the embryology discussions came to an end, and then the government of Britain began doling out tax dollars to these scientists on a case-by-case -case basis for the creation of human-animal chimeras. All right, now... Fast forward 24 months ago, and that's where this interview came in. The same scientists were back now, and they wanted to know, would it be okay if we take the next step? Can we now start raising these half-humans, half-animals to full maturity? Can we start raising islands of Dr. Moreau and doing long-term experiments on creatures that are part human and part animal? The other thing that this article was very interesting in is that it, the scientists admitted that they are um, satisfied, okay with 50-50 integration of humans and animals. Because most people have been led to believe, especially in the stem cell sciences, that uh, the amount of human material in one of these creatures is so minute as to be inexcusable. And what these scientists admitted was they were okay with fully 50-50 integration between humans and animals, and furthermore, they imply in this article that some of their colleagues were already pushing the boundaries anyway and raising these things to full maturity. Well, is that the case? Just last month, so that was 24 months ago, now just in the last month, the Academy of Medical Sciences in Britain admitted that such science is advancing so quickly that an international regulatory commission is needed to oversee the creation of mature human-animal chimeras. But look at this graphic they created here. On the, the uh, right-hand side is what appears to be um, a microscope lens. And what is depicted is all known forms of life from animals, uh, pigs, dogs, donkeys, fish, whatever. And notice the little line going over and integrating that genetic makeup in the man that is standing there in the middle wrapped in the double helix coil. Out of the back of the man with the double helix coil, it goes back into animals. And as you begin reading this uh, report, you come to understand that this graphic depicts the fact that they are acknowledging, first of all, that experiments are happening around the world at breakneck pace in which we are integrating humans with animal genetics and, and animals with human genetics. And this genie, ladies and gentlemen, is out of the bottle. This is actually a portion of the summary that says, this report considers research that involves the introduction of human DNA sequence into animals or the mixing of human and animal cells or tissues to create entities we refer to as animals containing human material. Oh, by the way, in the Old Testament, these were called Nephilim, Giborim. They had other names for what ultimately wound up being fantasized in Greek mythology, but that science was occurring. Such approaches, I'm back to quoting now, such approaches are long established and thousands of different ACHM. This is a terrific admission, by the way, on the part of the Academy of Medical Sciences out of Britain. Thousands of different ACHM have been used in biomedical research, yet they have received relatively little public discussion. Now, what type of creature uh, uh, creations are they talking about? These bullet points on here are actual exact uh, uh, extracts from this report, even the part that's in red, which I've only highlighted to point out to you. Note, number one, extensive modification of the brain of an animal by implantation of human-derived cells, which might result in altered cognitive capacity approaching human consciousness or sentience or human-like behavioral capabilities. Number two, situations 
Look at this. We're functioning human gametes. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about, uh, uh, we are talking about uh, fertilized uh, cells that can fertilize, gametes. Uh, eggs and sperm might develop from precursor cell types in an animal and where fertilization between human and animal gametes might then occur. We're talking about the creation of species that can cross uh, reproduce with humans. Uh, number three, cellular or genetic modification, which could result in animals with aspects of human-like appearance, skin type, limb or facial structure, or characteristics such as speech. Really? I mean, is this science really going on all around the world? One day after the Academy of Medical Sciences published their report, the Mail Online reported on only two of the tens of thousands of laboratories that are in Britain that are involved in this research, and in only two of them, 150 human-animal hybrids had been grown in UK labs. But ladies and gentlemen, it isn't just in Britain. The United States published its own similar report beating the United Kingdom by 20 years. And in their 1982 report, Splicing Life, the United States President's Commission for the Study of Ethical Problems in Medicine and Biomedical and Behavioral Research looked at the social and ethical issues of genetic engineering with human beings, including interfacing humans with nature and animal, as well as combining man with new forms of life. They were actually back then imagining synthetic biology, which of course the J.C. Uh, uh, J. Craig Venter Foundation has since accomplished, uh, uh, integrating man with synthetic forms of life. The report imagined that the dawn of this science would occur within 10 to 20 years. Now, why did I put down there how prophetic? Well, you're going to find out in a few moments. Because report after report from the government, this was published in 82, they imagined within 10 to 20 years, which would take us approximately to where we are now, or sometime around, in and around the year 2012. A date that continues to show up in government report after government report telling us that any time after the year 2012, uh, the first baby steps will be established that will ultimately lead to a new form of life. A new form of human will emerge upon the earth. Hang on to that thought for a moment. Uh, all is well, though, because at Emory University just last month, Rabbi Michael Broidy stepped forward to argue that Jewish law will support such animalized humans so long as it produces superior people. And there's the Emory Uni University screen grab. Here's a quick excerpt. Genetic engineering in which the traits of different individuals or animal animals are combined already has resulted in amazing combinations. Jewish law would support similar intentional human-human chimerism in which the embryonic material of two fetuses is mixed or human-animal chimerism in which the cells of a human are mixed with the cells of another mammal. Here's the Washington Post of mice, men, and in between. Scientists debate the blending of animals and human forms. Here's the New York Times. Merely human. That's so yesterday. Here's Counterpunch, Monsters, Inc., the Pentagon plan to create mutant super soldiers. Here's the Center for Bioethics and Human Dignity, the future of the human species. Here's Discovery News, part human, part machine transistors devised. Here's the Danger Room at the Wired Magazine. Pentagon looks to breed immortal synthetic organisms. And I want to say something about this news story, too. Top Pentagon scientists fear brain-modified foes. This is an article that was published about three years ago. I have included it with these newer reports for this reason. This was the first time that the public began to learn that some of the top think tanks that provide advisory information to the United States military now see the human enhancement revolution as the next arms race. That's right. In much the same way as the old Soviet Union competed with the United States during what is now called the uh, Cold War for nuclear supremacy, top advisors such as the Jasons, who are the Jasons? You can read it. They are the celebrated scientists on the Pentagon's most prestigious scientific advisory panel. And that's all you ever will know about them unless you have, like Chuck Missler, uh, top secret security clearance or access to such because these people are very guarded of their identities, but suffice to say they are among the scientific and academic uh, intelligentsia. And the Jasons have been advising 
the U.S. military in this report, and one that I did not include in this PowerPoint presentation that you should Google and read, is a newer report called the $100 Genome, Implications for the Department of Defense, in which, get this, they tell the Department of Defense that they only have until December of 2012. Now, why that date? December of 2012, and they said if we don't get ahead of this technology, by that date, our military risks, these are their words, falling unrecoverably behind in the race for personal genomics. And they, in that report, by the way, they talk about genotype and phenotype. If you remember your basic biology in school, genotype is what you are basically internally. I mean, this is what you inherited from your parents. This is your genetic makeup. But phenotype is how that is expressed externally. It's the way you walk, the way you talk, the fact that you're bipedal. It's what makes you look to me like you look to me. That's your phenotypic expressions. And the information from the or to the Department of Defense from the Jasons, what it is implying is as we begin altering humans in terms of their genetic makeup, they are going to start looking different. They're going to start walking different. They're going to start acting different. They're going to start becoming different. And once again, I think this happened once before in history. But this article right here three years ago was the first time that the public began to learn that these high-ranking top intelligence agency advisory panels now see human enhancement as potentially the next arms race. Well, i got to go very quick. Discovery Magazine looked into this technology and in the hands of transhumanist aspirations, concluded that it is the most dangerous idea in the history of the world. There are hundreds more similar news and peer-reviewed articles on the coming human enhancement revolution that we don't have time to talk about, so let's take a little turn in the road here now, and let me talk to you for the next little bit about something else. Uh, how soon? This is a big question. Before the human enhance enhancement revolution is widespread. Now, you say, okay, Tom, you mentioned the year 2012. Do you believe that uh, December 21st, 2012, the end of the Mayan calendar arrives and all of a sudden the floodgates open and the earth is swarmed with new Nephilim? No. I hope not. Although Isaiah did say, open the gates, ye ruler, I give command and I bring them. And in the Greek Septuagint it says, giants are coming to fulfill my wrath. Opening a gate. And this after the destruction of Babylon. So this is all very prophetic. Okay, so maybe, but I sure hope not. But the point is this, that this is the date that the experts believe that what we have been doing to genetically modified crops, what we have been doing to genetically modified animals, we are going to begin doing to humans, and ultimately it's going to uh, reach an exponential curve where there will be widespread commercialization of the altering of humans. It's going to start on the battlefield. It's in this year's DARPA budget for editing soldier DNA. But just like so many other things, DARPA invented the Internet, but now we all participate in it. The military developed global positioning satellite systems, and now every one of us have phones and GPS navigators in our car. So what begins in the battlefield is going to ultimately make its way into the broader culture at large. And for whatever reason, like this report right here, Converging Technologies for Improving Human Performance. It's got bullet points. It's got graphs in it. It, all talking about how these sciences are going to be used to create a new version of man. In fact, you remember the old commercial that showed uh, an egg inside of a frying pan frying and it said, this is your brain on drugs? Well, if you read this, you'll understand why they show a man with his brain on the front of it because this is your brain on transhumanism. That's what this is all about. But I think there's something, oh, oh, and this was published approximately a decade ago in which they speculated that approximately within a decade, sometime around the year 2012, uh, the first baby steps towards the emergence of a new form of man. Now, what's very strange about this to me, and I will apologize here if suddenly I start becoming a little bit of a preacher maybe. Is that okay? Anything to wake you up. Uh, there, there's something here that I can't quite put my finger on, but it is very unusual. And you know that one of the approaches in the Koinonia Institute is you deal with probabilities. Sometimes you can't really nail something down beyond a shadow of a doubt, but what you can say is it's 99% probable that this is the way it is. 
Uh, and when I deal with mathematical probabilities, I can't understand why. For instance, all of our reports are looking to the year 2012, but did you know that for thousands of years, occultic societies around the world prophesied, not just the Maya, that in the year 2012, there would come the emergence of a new form of man upon the earth. See, the Maya didn't say that December 21st, 2012 would be the end of the world. And you see these modern Maya. In fact, don't we have something like a group of them right now going across the United States with 13 crystal skulls talking about all this? I think I read something about that in the news or heard something about it. And they're, they're celebrating the, uh, the coming of 2012, but they're going to wind up in some place like New York on 11-11-11. All of these are very uh, powerful occultic numbers. Uh, but what these new Maya uh, and what the old Maya, what they actually were saying was, there's going, uh, they, first of all, it's all based on the procession of the equinox, the rotation of the planets, doodly doodly doo. Uh, and uh, they were very, <laughs> well, I just don't want to get into that. They, 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 they were very uh, strong, uh, smart astronomers. So somehow they either knew it or uh, an invisible spirit whispered it in their ear, which might be part of a thousands of year old plan to lead to great deception. Could be. But in any case, somehow they knew it. And uh, they set their calendar in in uh, 2012. But the Maya, their, their prophets, by the way, one of their prophets became a Christian, and he combined his prophecies with what he called the Christian last judgment and still believes that the year 2012 is significant, but then from a, uh, and this was during the 1600s, by the way, with uh, uh, prophecies from the Bible. In any case, what they believed was, if I can get my head on track here, first of all, that there is going to come the return of their feathered or winged dragon god, their serpent god that you see celebrated throughout Mesoamerica, which would be uh, during a time of great tribulation upon the earth, followed by the emergence of an, of an enlightened man on earth, a new form of humanity. The Aztecs believed the same thing and also set their calendar to end in the year 2012, also accompanied with the return of their feathered or uh, uh, serpent god that has the power of flight. And by the way, that's a very interesting uh, iconography that turns up over and over and over in these belief systems. If you, uh, if you read the book I wrote, Apollyon Rising 2012, in which I show how this date 2012 is encoded on the great seal of the United States, more importantly, the prophecy on the great seal, the Novus Ordo Seclorum, is taken from the Kume Sibyl, uh, a priestess of Apollo, who prophesied that at the end of time, Apollo would return to the earth and it would give birth to a new golden age. Well, the golden age in Greek mythology is when the gods and the demigods walked upon the earth. And her prophecy is not just that Apollo will return, but that it will give birth to a new race of uh, people who have been merged with the gods. So again, the same kind of symbolism, uh, but Apollo's father, according to her prophecy, is uh, Jupiter, and if you look at ancient depictions of Jupiter, he is pulled through the heavens uh, by two flying-winged serpents. So over and over again, you see this imagery of a, fly, a dragon that has the power of air, or a giant serpent that has the power of air, the power of flight, returning in the year 2012. Well, let's go further. The Hindus, they set their Kali Yuga calendar, the age of the male demon, to end in the year 2012. Here in America, 200 years ago, the Cherokee Indian tribe, during an entire frenzied moment of apocalyptic prophecies, also set their calendar to end in the year 2012, and again with the return of their feathered rattlesnake god, their flying serpent that had the power of air. But did you know this? 700 years ago, see my legs wanting to walk? 700 years ago, Jewish mystics, in the uh, Zohar, this is the most important book of uh, Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah, magic, occultism. Uh, 700 years ago, these uh, Orthodox priests who rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah, when speculating about when the Messiah would arrive, in the Vieira section of the Zohar, under the subsection Signs Heralding Mashiach, set the date of his appearing in the Jewish calendar year 5773, which in our Gregorian calendar, guess what, begins in the new moon 2012 and extends into the following year 2013. A 700-year-old occultic 
Jewish prophecy from guys who said, when our Messiah comes, it'll be the year 2012. Because they rejected Jesus Christ, who are they talking about? They're talking about the coming of the Antichrist in the year 2012. But did you know that a hundred years before that, another occultic figure, a Catholic priest, a prophet by the name of Malachi O'Morger, or who the Catholics more commonly know as Saint Malachi, went into a frenzy and also prophesied. And he prophesied a famous prophecy that today is known as the prophecy of the popes, in which he named every pope that would exist from his day to the final pope, from Celestine II all the way down to the final pope who he named Petrus Romanus, Peter the Roman. And guess what? Benedict the 16th is the next to the last pope. Benedict is 85 years old. He's having health issues. He's already talking about retirement. And there was also a threat on his life. The very next pope, if this prophecy is accurate, and by the way, if you study the prophecy, it is mysteriously accurate for whatever occultic influence that was there, it seemed to know something. Uh, the very next pope will be Petrus Romanus, who, St. Malachi said, will give assistance to the rise of the Antichrist. So, ladies and gentlemen, all around the world, prophecies from thousands of years, from all kinds of disparate societies, uh, who we have no uh, we have no information, no knowledge that uh, many of these cultures knew each other, but all prophesying a, a, a forward moment in time. Now, how could that be possible? Do I put the prophecy of the Maya or Malachi o Morger or any other Oger on a level with the prophecies of the Bible? Absolutely, I do not. My interest in this is why this occultic presence for thousands of years, separated by time and distance in all these cultures, has been fascinated with a date in which they, ima they imagine the return of their great dragon having the power of flight and the emergence of a new form of man on earth. By the way, the Kume Sibyl's prophecy about the return of Apollo, that if you dig in your purse or wallet and put out a $1 bill, you've got that prophecy in your possession right now, the Novus Ordo Seclorum, the return of Apollo uh, at that date. Uh, uh, Apollo turns up also in New Testament theology. Uh, when speaking of the Antichrist, it says he will be the son of perdition. And this term is Apollia, Apollyon, Apollo. It is the ancient word that depicted the god Apollo. And so even New Testament theology would seem to imply that the spirit that is going to inhabit the Antichrist, which was prophesied 700 years ago by Jewish mystics who rejected Jesus Christ as appearing in September, the new moon of 2012. Ladies and gentlemen, what is going on? And then the big question is, why have all of our government reports and these various agencies and the science community, why do they keep fascinating about the year 2012 after which there is going to be the emergence of a new form of man? I believe there is something deeply occultic about this, deeply deceptive about this. I think that a ton of the New Age community and tens of thousands of people around the world are being deceived and looking forward to the coming of some space age savior if you will, who could appear around that time. Now, is that going to happen? I don't know, but I'm telling you that mathematically, the, the improbability, this has got to be in the order of hundreds of millions to one, that all of that concatenation of prophetic significance from an occultic societies all around the world speculating about this date, and then our own government telling us that, that yeah, we agree with that. 2012 sounds like a good date for me for all to become little demigods. Sorry. <laughs> well, whereas 2012 may be looked back on as the dawn of the human enhancement revolution, Time magazine considered the matter, interviewed Mr. Singularity himself, Ray Kurzweil, and concluded that 2045 is the year that man becomes immortal. Some believe the new man is going to be here even sooner, however, and they are preparing for it. At the School of Law, Birkbeck, the University of London, Preparations are already being talked about. Birkbeck is one of the leading law schools that teaches crime scene investigation. And they put out a press release not long ago talking about CSI. And if you know anything about CSI, of course, right, this is specially trained law enforcement officers, right? Uh, they're trained. They go into a crime scene. They make detailed uh, measurements in the crime scene. They take photographs. They rope it off so that those who are not trained to be there won't be. 
uh, and then they start collecting all this forensics information. It might be a drop of blood. It might be a drop of spittle. It could be a cotton fiber. It could be something out of a car. It could be a tire track. It could be a footprint they want to make a cast of. If there's a body there, it could be the way the body has been treated. Uh, but in any case, then they metic meticulously and carefully collect all of the forensics information, put it in special containers to avoid cross-contamination, unless... This is O.J. Simpson's crime scene, and then they scoop it all into a giant bag and go like that. <laughs> and then they send it to the crime laboratory where the entire crime scene is put back together, and ultimately they come out of this, hundreds of years, by the way, of this analytical type of, of uh, uh, law enforcement science. They come out and basically they say something like, we are looking for probably... Uh, a Caucasian male between the ages of 18 to 24 years of age. He is probably part of an affluent community or he is addicted to drugs or whatever the analysis has told him. And then this becomes a very powerful tool for profiling who the perpetrator of that criminal activity might have been. Well, the Birkbeck University recently said, if we go down this road, we are going to have to introduce new crime scene analysis classes for dealing with crime scenes that have been perpetrated by human non-humans. And the whole point is that if a, a serial rapist, for instance, is part wolf, this thing might behave in ways that we can't even comprehend, way outside the paradigm of uh, our understanding. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that such uh, things are going to have to be talked about sooner than later was actually dramatically illustrated in research not long ago by Professor Ivan Balaban at the McGill University in Montreal, Canada. And what Balaban did was he took the developing brain matter of embryonic quail and he genetically engineered it into the developing brain matter of embryonic chickens. And the developing chickens grew up to exhibit head bobs and vocal trills ex uh, that are natural to quail. And what his uh, experiment so dramatically illustrated is that very, very, very complex behavior patterns can be transferred across species line from one species to another through genetic engineering. Well, how big might the implications from Professor Balaban's research be? Uh, here is the front cover of the Global Governance 2025 at a critical juncture. 2025 is only 13 or so years from now. So basically this report is talking about what might occur this decade. Now what is this report about? First notice this, that this is published by the United States Office of the Director of National Intelligence working with the European Institute of Security Studies. This was published 13 months ago. So we're talking about top-level intelligence agencies in the United States and Europe working together for what purpose? To try to determine what might set in motion the need for a global government. That's why it's called Global Governance 2025. Uh, basically what they're saying is what could happen that could suddenly cause all of the nations of the world to have to come together in mutual protection of one another against an unprecedented threat. That's what they're talking about. And so they talk about biological warfare. Uh, they talk about the collapse of the economy, which Chuck Missler was talking about before lunch today. They talk about all of that as potentially leading to the need for a one world government but then on page 35, look how things start getting interesting. No forum currently exists for dealing comprehensively across the scientific community, industry, and government on measures needed to diminish the risk posed by the biotechnology revolution. In addition, biotechnology can drive new forms of human behavior and association, creating profound cross-cultural ethical questions that will be increasingly politically contentious. Few experts believe that current governance instruments are adequate for these challenges. That's what the Birkbeck Law School was also saying. For example, direct modification of DNA, this is germline genetic engineering, which we talked about earlier, uh, at fertilization is widely researched with the goal of removing defective genes. However, discussions of future capabilities open the possibility for designing humans with unique physical, emotional, or cognitive abilities, end quote. So ladies and gentlemen, imagine this now. The top intelligence agencies of the United States working with the top intelligence agencies in Europe, saying, okay, boys, what do we imagine 
could be the trigger event that will set in motion the need for all of the nations of the world to come together under a single umbrella in mutual defense of an unprecedented threat. And among the things that they chose to talk about is the emergence of a new form of human. Well, is this report from the American and, and European intelligence communities overstating the facts? Not according to a series of recent House Foreign Affairs Committee hearings that were held in California a while back. De uh, California Democrat Brad Sherman, who's uh, known for his expertise in the spread of nuclear weapons, or uh, nuclear, yeah, we weapons of mass destruction among terrorists, was picked to uh, chair these meetings. Well, what were the meetings about? A journalist for Congressional Quarterly Magazine by the name of Mark Stenzel attended the events, listened to the HFA hearings, then went back and wrote a feature article for CQ Magazine called Futurist Genes Without Borders, in which he described listening to the HFA hearings as sounding more like a Hollywood pitch for a sci-fi movie than it did a sober discussion of scientific reality with all of its discussion of super animals, super intelligence, and superhumans on the near horizon that represent an existential threat against which mankind is not prepared. Well, ladies and gentlemen, in designing humans with unique physical, emotional, and cognitive abilities, I believe that we could be witnessing the unfolding of biblical prophecy. Anybody agree with that? First of all, genetically altering living organisms could unleash plagues of end times proportions. Uh, what does God know that we don't know besides a lot <laughs> about why he put barriers between the species that we are now so freely crossing over? Uh, we used to look at verses like Zechariah 14, 12, talking about people's flesh consuming off of them while they stand, and we would interpret this as possibly radiological contamination from a nuclear confrontation, and that might be what it is. But now, with the biotech revolution, ladies and gentlemen, we are opening a Pandora's box to a million kinds of a molecular biological nightmare. We could unleash in one day, I don't want to scare you, but a black death, or it could be intentionally controlled tribe by a terrorist organization and right now uh, security experts are staying up at night and can hardly sleep knowing that you can go on eBay and buy a gene sequencer and open a lab in your garage and start synthesizing living organisms. As a matter of fact, this stuff is becoming so easy that all college, uh, uh, colleges across the United States right now have what they call the iGym co uh, uh, competition where college kids are creating new forms of novel life in fact, it's called iGym because it has to be a living machine. It has to actually accomplish something, and awards are being given out on our universities every year now for new synthetically uh, formed creations of life. I believe that what we're seeing in the biotech revolution, and by the way, let me insert something here. I don't believe everything happening in the biotech revolution is negative. Uh, somebody, I was doing a radio show recently, they said, well, do you see anything good coming out of biotech? And I said, oh, there could be all kinds of good things that could come out of it. If we could learn to how to simply turn off a cancerous cell, that would be a great thing, right? My issue is in altering humans, genetically re-engineering and tampering and crossing species barriers that is an assault upon the divine order. And when you assault God, you're probably not going to win in that boxing match. I believe it could also be a fulfillment of Luke 17, 29, where uh, our Lord says that His appearing would be as in the days of Lot. If you go, as I said earlier, to the Brookings Institute right now, you'll see where they're making the arguments for the creation of homosexually, genetically engineered, gay Gattaca communities. And then lastly, I believe it could be a fulfillment of Matthew 24, 37, when our Lord's uh, disciples, closest disciples, said, Lord, tell us, what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the aeon, the end of the age? He gave them a whole series of signs that are all unfolding around the world as we speak. And then he ended it by saying, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. What was it that happened in the days of Noah? Ancient records around the world tell the story of powerful angels, genetic scientists, who left their habitation and descended to earth. 
The story includes genetic alteration of human and animal genetics. In fact, the Bible itself, by the way, tells us that the flood came because all flesh, both man and beast, had been corrupted. And many of the ancient records even uh, describe uh, the blending of these species, which then later turns up in Greek mythology. But the result was to create a body into which they could extend themselves, later became known as the Nephilim. Some scholars believe this story is reflected in Genesis 6-4, which says, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. But even if someone disagrees with that assessment, discredits the prophetic questions that I have raised, or disagrees with certain theological uh, situations like the angel theory of Genesis, which I happen to believe, which is very interesting because when I was a young preacher and knew everything there is to know about doctrine in the world because I graduated from a Bible college and bless God, I'm the answer man, I was a Sethite. I no longer believe this than the man in the moon. And the first person that brought this theory to me, I said, you are out of your mind. But when you're honest... And I was. This is, I, I came to believe that everything in history supports this theory. Now, again, you don't have to agree with me, but you would need to recognize that neither God nor evolution. So it doesn't really matter what your worldview is. If you're sitting here today, you're not a Christian, you're a, you're a Darwinian evolutionist, you would have to admit that what we are doing now was uh, not allowed by God or evolution. And as a result, I think we could soon learn what I call the Brundlefly lesson. Want to know what I mean? Have you seen that old movie, The Fly? And there was this scientist by the name of Seth Brundle, and he was conducting teleportation experiments. And one day he goes into Machine A, not aware that a common house fly had flown in there, and he pushes the button, is discombobulated. He is transferred to Machine A where he is remolecularized, walks out of the machine feeling fine, not aware, that his genetics have been combined with the genetics of a common house fly. Well, very soon he starts becoming the transhumanist dream come true. He's got lightning quick agilities, superhuman strength, the sexual proclivities of an African lion. But then something else happens, and he starts mutating into a horrific monster and has to be destroyed. Jeff Goldblum, who starred in the remake of that film, also starred in the Jurassic Park movies. And I love the scene in the first Jurassic Park. He's playing a character, by the way, uh, a Weasley-looking guy. Jeff Goldblum plays a very good Weasley-looking guy. By the name of Ian Malcolm, who is a scientist that subscribes to the chaos theory. And he is in the back of a Jeep. Do you remember this scene? And uh, I think the guy's driving and the woman's sitting here, and they are being chased down the road by a giant man-eating Tyrannosaurus Rex that is nipping at the back of the Jeff Goldblum character's head who's leaning forward, and he says to the people in front of him, who in the world thought this was a good idea? <laughs> who thinks what I'm talking about is a good idea? Members of government, military, philosophy, futurists, the science community, academia, and this is happening, by the way, I'm going to be interviewing Professor Holbert, who was in the film with uh, Chuck Missler at Stanford University in the spring for our film, our documentary on transhumanism, and he said, when you get here, I want to introduce you to the Transhumanist Society, the students group, or whatever they're called, uh, on campus. That's happening all across the United States, every campus, Stanford University, Oxford University, the people that hold the prestigious seats there have written their thesis on transhumanist values, such as Professor Nick Bostrom. You can go to nickbostrom.com and read his report on transhumanist values in which he celebrates how we are going to combine ourselves with animals. And the good of this, he says, is because animals can, uh, they have modes of perception that we do not have. Well, I read that and I said, you're right. The Bible tells me that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, Balaam's donkey could see the angel and Balaam could not. Some animals might indeed be able to see into the spirit world and I think that this is part of the problem here. There are invisible entities that are inviting us to make contact. And ladies and gentlemen, it may not end very well. 
Uh, there is the cover of the book, Forbidden Gates. I don't have time to talk about any of that other stuff. Here is the new book, Pandemonium's Engine, which Dr. Missler was so uh, graceful in writing a chapter for. We try to abduct him into anything we're doing anytime we can. Uh, but Christians have got to get involved in this discussion. Don't wait on your church or your pastor to do the job for you. Get personally educated on the basic issues, the basic ethics. Secondly, employ your particular talent or strength to engage. So if you're involved in politics, uh, if grandma wants to get on her knees and take this to God, that would be okay with me. There is power. The devil trembles when he sees the weakest Christian on their knees, right? From media, if that's what you do, to education, whatever it is you do, make the issue of transhumanism some part of your sphere of influence. It doesn't have to dominate your life, but at least have a basic knowledge of what is coming because, ladies and gentlemen, the average American is completely unprepared for not only what is coming, but how quickly it is going to be here, actually already is here. There were two children born in Britain recently that are the genetic offspring of three genetic donors. We're already doing this in the earliest stages. Uh, but So make it a part of your influence. Also remember to operate in love and respect of others. That's why, by the way, the title of this book, have you ever seen a longer title? Forbidden Gates, How Genetics, Robotics, Artificial Intelligence, Synthetic Biology, Nanotechnology, and Human Enhancement Herald the Dawn of Techno-Dimensional Spiritual Warfare. Uh, uh, the National Science Foundation report, the, most, the newest one, uh, Ethics of Human Enhancement, 25 Questions and Answers, that little picture down there on the bottom to the left, I did not include uh, in today's uh, discussion about this is an NSF, another report that you paid for. And uh, Patrick Lynn, who is the co-author of that report, went on the Institute of Ethics and Emerging Technologies, the IEET, uh, and referred to me as a pig and as a person who would make people like Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, proud. And what was my crimes against humanity? I had written an article called Open Letter to Christian Leaders, on biotechnology and the future of man. Uh, it was picked up by The Wire. It was published at Wired Magazine. And all I was asking pastors to do is read the stuff that these people are saying and be aware of it. Well, he didn't like that. And uh, so, uh, but, the, but the point about all of this, ladies and gentlemen, is that I know from experience we have entered into an ideological battle. We are at war for the mind of a generation. Make no mistake about that. Thank you very much for allowing me to come here today and take some of your time.